production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at the history of the city's financial problems tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by a roundtable of guests focused on the recent series, the financial mess and the commercial appeal. Tonight shows the first of two shows, and I'm glad to have Mark Paraskia, project reporter for the commercial appeal and the lead reporter on the series. We've also got Rick Masson, a former CAO for the city of Memphis. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Marlon Mosby, former finance director and sometime consultant to the city. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Henry Evans, another former CAO for the city. Thanks Thank for you. being here. And Tom Jones, a sometime consultant to the city and a consultant to cities all over the country and sometimes around the world. Thank you all for being here. Um, let me go to you, Mark, and, and talk. That we're going to do this in two parts, two shows, because you covered so much, you and the, the other folks who did it. Um, there was annexation, population loss, the rise of debt and spending, and that's what we'll focus on in this show. And the next show, we'll get to the other parts of the series, uh, pension, the drop portion of the pension system, uh, spending on MPD, on the police department, and, and kind of more of a look at the pain ahead, as the, as the, the series called it. Um, but for you, what... How did this, the, the city get into what you guys are really pointed in, not calling a crisis, but a kind of a mess that we're in right now? And we're even in budget season right as we tape this show. But what happened? Well, there were a number of factors. And, you know, some of the more immediate factors were, of course, the, the economy crashing in, in 2008 and some of the consequences after that. The city made some missteps. They uh, they uh, did something called a scoop and toss in they, they decided to not fund the city schools anymore, lost a court decision, and were ordered to repay $57 million and were facing similar payments every year, and they didn't have the money. So they did something called a scoop and toss where they refinanced a portion of their debt and took their, some of those payments and tossed them into future years, which created this huge bubble going forward where they were facing massive debt service payments um, about $160 million, about $25 million more than what they're paying now by, by right. 2022. And so, so there were immediate factors, but there were also long-term, long-range factors going back years to how the city grew. Right, and we'll get into some of that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to get some of your sense. I want to go to Henry. You were CAO back many years ago when the city faced some financial trouble then. When you look at financial trouble in the past, you look at where the city is now. I mean, what's your perspective? I became CAO in 75, and we were just coming out of the wage and price freezes and everything of the early 70s. We also, in 1975, had virtually no reserves. Right. They had been drawn down rather substantially in the first part of that decade. And so we were trying to find ways to increase our reserves. We also knew we had a pension liability out there. Uh, we were trying to maintain current funding for the self-insured insurance program for employees. And at the same time, we were having to focus a lot of time and energy on how do we save downtown? How do we revitalize that very important part of our tax base? And so a lot of our capital projects were focused on downtown and the infrastructure citywide. And that was the era, and you can just correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, Beale Street investment, Mud Island was kind of in that phase into the 80s. Uh, what other kind of big... Mud Island the, actually mall? was approved by the council in the 77, yeah. 78 time frame. Uh, it'd been on the on the books looking at developing that for five years and the problem yeah. that really hit us is that the original estimate was never up, updated <laughs> and by the time it was approved it was sorely out of date yeah but mud island was a big thing uh, marlin will remember we had a lot of drainage and uh, sewer issues that had to be addressed citywide, as right. well as street systems right. that had right. to be addressed. Right. Well, let's go, Marlon. I mean, looking at the financial mess now, looking at, at problems back you know, to the 70s and 80s, what is your take on how the city has ended up where it is? Um, I think 2007, 2008, 
that crisis and the fact that then the tax base was such that it wouldn't support and the population wouldn't support any additional revenue. And they had eliminated any other form of revenue other than the property tax, basically. And the people were unwilling to raise taxes. And so uh, the administration's made some really bad decisions, if you look back at it, and, and, and trying to balance budgets without any source of revenue um, that was realistic. Yeah, and get uh, your, your take, Rick. I mean, the, 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 there was, through the Harrington administration, you were part CAO for part of that time. There increases in spending, and we'll get into that, increases in debt, but also huge investments in the city that hadn't been made in a long time. I mean, do you, do you look back at those choices and where the city is now? Are they related, or, again, those were necessary investments at that time? Well, I mean, we faced, uh, uh, early on, we faced a, 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 a very low reserve as well when we started the administration, but then things picked up, and then Mayor Harrington had made a commitment to make investments in the inner city. We made those investments. You know, in those days, in early days, and throughout the administration of the Harrington, I don't know what the status is right now, but we issued what's called 20-year series bonds, and so that doesn't mean they're paid off in 20 years. That means the last of the bonds are paid off in 20 years. Uh, at that time, 60% of the debt was paid off within 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of that debt is was paid off rather aggressively in a very short period of time. Uh, but there were major investments that we felt we needed to make in downtown, uh, in the inner city, uh, quite a few investments in community centers, swimming pools for the community, so, and the roads. There were a lot of investments we made in roads, and of course the, the big ones, you know, the, the FedEx Forum and the in the in the AutoZone Park, were, but those were not related to uh, general obligation of the debt of the city. Yeah. But uh, there were a lot of investments that we made that we right. thought were necessary, and we made investments in public safety. Uh, yeah. And you know, getting back to you know, we all had, well, all of us had, t including the current administration, they have tough decisions to make. Okay, that's just that that comes with the territory, and there's always going to be someone that's going to second guess you. So you have to, you can look back and you say, oh, if we hadn't done this, we hadn't. We, 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 I think right. with a lot of this, if other right. decisions hadn't been made, things could have been worse. Yeah. Let's get, Tom, not just in Memphis, but I mean, it's obviously a national discussion right now. They're coming out of the financial crisis and the, the Great Recession and so on. I mean, many cities suddenly looked and said, whoa, our pension obligations, our tax base, there were huge problems exposed in, in the, the depth of that financial crisis. I mean, where do you look at city, cities, Memphis, in comparison to other cities in terms of their financial position? Yeah, there, there are a lot of cities in the same boat that Memphis is in. Memphis is coming back slower its economic comeback is slower. Uh, it's fighting uh, some structural issues like high poverty rate, lower property values, and and essentially, it, you know, the city of Memphis now finds itself being a government trying to serve too few people over too much land. Yeah. Right. And you know, you can't fault the city. At least I can't fault the city for what it did in trying to chase its population. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that's all right. As it moved as it moved east, but... Uh, no, that's fine, I and mean, that gives us the segue into annexation, which is the first of the main, of the sort, series, and why, Mark, did you guys start with annexation? I mean... Well, I mean, it was really, it was a coin toss. It was, it was a combination of the annexation and the population loss, and, and that's kind of the key to the whole thing, is that the, um, the city, when we went back and looked through planning documents over the years and how they captured the people coming into the city, the city gained as many as 157,000 people through annexation since 1970, but when you look at the population now and then, there's actually fewer people in Memphis now than there were in 1975. Right. right. Well, let's go back. I mean, annexation started in, in around that you were CAO when some of that annexation was going on. Is that correct? I mean, well, the big piece of annexation was probably Whitehaven, and the Whitehaven annexation, as I recall, took place in 69. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first annexation that the Chandler administration dealt with was Raleigh, and I believe that was in 1972. But our approach to annexation was we did need to go where the people were. We needed to make sure before we annexed that the area would support the cost of annexation because there is a substantial cost. And then during the course of the years that, that I was there, we actually turned our back on some annexations. We we were facing an annexation in Hickory Hill, and we reached an agreement that we would delay that for X number of years. 
We had uh, Cordova and Countrywood try to incorporate in 1980, and that was, we, we reacted by trying to go out and annex, but we didn't want to annex. It was going to be too expensive to go all the way out. So annexation had to be balanced by the cost of annexation, even though there was a desire to bring the people into the city. It, it, in the, and there's a graphic from the series, and we'll put it up on the screen here so people can see it, that shows the, the city boundaries in, I think it's 60, and then to 2010, and it's an amazing thing to see. I mean, just to, to see that sort of growth, and so that now the, the city of Memphis um, is the bigger than, and you had this in the story, Mark, it's 320 square miles. It's bigger physically than New York City. It's bigger than Boston, St. Louis, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C. combined. Yes. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. But why, let me go to Tom again. Like, just again, Memphis isn't the only city by any stretch of imagination that is annexed. Why do cities annex, and, and what is your perspective looking back on the choices of annexation that, that Memphis made? Most cities don't get to annex like Memphis annexed. State laws don't allow them to. You look at St. Louis, Birmingham, Louisville, they're even in a consolidated government, they're surrounded and hemmed in by just dozens, <clears throat> dozens of cities. I, I remember a few years ago when the St. Louis Airport wanted to change some runways and it had to enter agreement with 12 cities. Right. Yeah. So yeah. The gov since this system of government here is pretty simple, but n you don't find many cities that have annexed like us. And, and the issue was, to me, that while Memphis was annexing and it seemed logical at the time, what was happening is you were losing the population right. of Chattanooga within the 1970s city limits of Memphis. In fact, to, uh, yeah. for me, I often say Memphis has a Chattanooga problem. We lost the population of Chattanooga within the 1970 city limits. We have the population of Chattanooga in poverty, and we have the population of Chattanooga commuting into work in Memphis. Yeah. I think yeah, that, that, that was, was yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> dis on, discounting, they going. would do these studies and d would the cost of annex annexation pay for itself, but, the, but you had to discount that over the years because so many people would leave. Yeah, right. there was, well, well, Go ahead, Bill. Well, a couple, on, on that particular point, you also have to factor in, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably anticipate where Tom's going. You also anticipate uh, include the factor that those folks, uh, their, their services, for the most part, most of their services, 70 percent of their, pub, uh, their public safety, 70 percent of their roads, 100 uh, 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 percent of their amenities, if you will, were being paid for by the citizens of Memphis. Okay, mm -hmm. so there were urban services being provided outside, right on the border of the city of Memphis, that were being paid for by citizens of Memphis, and therefore that that the other thing, uh, and to your point about annexation, didn't start with the Chandler administration. Yeah, I, you know, we're, during the tiny town uh, uh, debate, I spent a lot of time looking at annexation. The entire, except for a small area around Court Square, the entire city was annexed. Okay, right. So one could argue, and I and I know the annexation is getting kicked around now, but one could argue that were it not for annexation, we might be in a worse situation than we're in now. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you make the point, Mark. You know, Central Gardens, Chickasaw, Bell Mead. I mean, right. these were all River Oaks. These were all uh, Midtown. annexed. Midtown. You know, Midtown. All of Midtown was annexed. It's obviously one of a, a thriving part of the urban, urban right. core, and, and many parts of the uh, Midtown are. But but you were going to say something too. Let me get on the annexation question. Your, your sense of that? Um, at the time, we looked at other cities that had been landlocked, and we thought the solution was that we, we were blessed here with the, the state law and that we could avoid the issues that other cities had by annexing and bringing those funds yeah. in. What we didn't do is realize what we had to do to keep people in the city. And had to, and to develop yeah. the core city. If you look at the cities that were in fact landlocked, St. Louis being the great example because it was totally landlocked, they then had to focus on St. Louis and make St. Louis a place that people wanted to live. We, because we were constantly growing and constantly moving, didn't make yeah. that focus. I read an interesting uh, article about Fer we talk about St. Louis and, and but also Ferguson when all everything that was going on in Ferguson, I guess it's still going on, that somebody, I think it was New York Times had an article about how part of Ferguson's problem and the reason they had all those high court costs and the ticketing and the really kind of arguably abusive things they were doing, they didn't have enough of a, of a tax base. They, had, they were desperate. It wasn't right. that they were trying to abuse and take advantage of people. They didn't have enough of a tax base. And isn't that a thing that cities that don't annex, you just end up too small and not enough of a tax base? So well, is it a sweet spot? Before Tom responds to sure. that, go back to the 70s and look at what was also helping to drive our strategy. And that was that not only 
did we want to prevent the city from being landlocked, but we had a geographic issue that a lot of cities don't have. Our, yeah. our western city limits is a river, and our southern city limits is another state. Yeah. And so we had to realize that the growth of the city would always be north and southeast and, and to the east. And if we got landlocked by Bartlett and Germantown and or the future of Lakeland, then we would have nowhere to go. Yeah. And so one of the things we did in addition to annexation was to negotiate with all of the other cities in the, in the county to establish future boundaries so that we protected an annexation corridor yeah. to the east primarily yeah. and yeah. again to the northeast. Mm -hmm. I think the irony is, though, nobody has a crystal ball, but the irony is that if you get a heat map of where Memphis's property taxes come from and where its sales taxes are coming yeah. from, it's largely within the 1970 city limits of Memphis. Yeah. So but, it's... But, but I would argue, Tom, that the, if, if the city had a point set, okay, we're not going to annex, and, and then, which really, we're talking about annexation, the reality is sewer extensions, let's be honest. Yeah. It, you know, yeah. Sprawl does not occur because of annexation. Annexation is the end result of sewer extension and urban sprawl. If, if the city of Memphis had said, we are not going to extend our sewers, we're not going to grow beyond the 1960 or the 1970 boundary, I think it's quite plausible that the development community would have gone to, to, to Nashville and said, hey, we have to grow our state. If we don't have annexation and sewer extensions in, inside, and they don't want to annex, let's allow us to form new cities on the border. We had tiny town in 1968 versus 1998. And we would have had the city of Whitehaven, the city of Oakhaven, the city of, of Raleigh, the city of, and we wouldn't be talking about Cuyahoga, we'd be talking about Whitehaven and Oakhaven. We were talking earlier about the restrictions that some of the small cities placed on the airport in St. Louis. What about the city of Oakhaven, the restrictions it may have placed on a small right. entrepreneur that was coming to town talking about flying planes into the city of Memphis all hours of the night. And so I think, I think we, we really need to look and say, it, 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 you look, again, getting back to those decisions, the decisions you make, you, you, it's sort of like armchair quarterback. See, okay, this is what happened. But if you had made another decision, what might have happened? And I honestly think that if we had, if we had stopped the growth, that those folks would have left anyway, and we would not have had that tax base. I like to think that we would have focused on, on, on the city improvements, but Marlin, in 1960, people were not moving outside into the suburbs because of crime or because of high taxes or because of schools. They were moving because they wanted this newfangled thing called the den. You know, they wanted new uh, ranch home. They, that's where they were being built, and that's what they wanted. Right, I mean, right. I think we have to be honest and. But that uh, all the mo I, your point being that the, all these different factors that cause suburban sprawl and growth and, and people right, leaving cities right. across and the I country. And I think things could have been worse. It would have happened anyway. Yeah. And and, and Memphis yeah. could be in a worse position. It would, could be in Detroit. Right. I don't think we could have ever been Detroit. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, agree. Yeah. I just don't think that's possible. And I think you can certainly question. Looking backwards, you can certainly question the wisdom of expand, you know, increasing the area 60% while you decrease the density by 50%. Yeah, right. But that's easy. What I would say in response to Rick and, and what I said in the commercial appeal was that the city really didn't have any choices. As long as you've got a county government that's providing incentives for sprawl right. and also subsidizing town services uh, like Shelby County was paying for 50% uh, of the road cost inside of the, in the municipalities. They weren't doing that in Memphis. And so to Rick's point, 70% of the cost of subsidizing sprawl was coming from Memphians. They were being forced yeah. to yeah. subsidize the, county, the, the, the deterioration yeah. of their own neighborhoods. Well, we started talking about spending, and we got about eight, ten minutes left in the show here. And, and part of what went on with this, and you describe in, in great detail, is the increase in spending and the increase in debt that... that, that to some degree tracked this growth because you've got all these areas taken on in the what the Hickory Hill agreement was alone was it Hickory Hill that was a hundred and fifty million dollar agreement that when so, that was annexed something like that to, mm -hmm. to invest all of that spending that went on um, increased the amount of debt so we're now at a debt level at about a million a billion three um, but the when you were in office you all faced a big debt problem and worked through that, I believe. Is that correct? I mean, you look back, I mean, the city, your point in the article is the city has worked through debt problems before. What mm -hmm. does it take to work through a debt problem? I think we were very sensitive to what our financial advisors were telling us was an acceptable 
debt ratio to the tax base to our ability to raise revenues. And even though we had some capital expenses that were going to hit us that needed to hit us, that we had to address, <coughs> I think we were pretty conservative, Marlon, in terms of managing the debt load at that time. Would you agree or disagree? No, I agree. It, and and it, I mean, we were building stuff, but we we the ratio of debt to, to to income was lower than it is now, and we were very sensitive to ratings and 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 how we looked into in the market and our ability to get to that market. But that was true until oh seven oh eight. I mean, it was really 07, 08 when the crisis hit, when the pension fund took the hit, when basically the city ran out of money and, and, and then resorted to trying to get rid of the schools to yeah. save money. And I mean, that's the, the, it all turned, it seems to me, basically in those three, two, and, three and years. And uh, we'll put a chart up again from the series that shows the, the, the spending, the rise in spending over the last, you know, four decades or so. And so, Mark, from your point of view, I mean, summarize or what the article found in terms of all these sources of increases in spending, operational spending, and also in debt. Well, if you, if you plotted out the debt, I mean, and, and adjusted for inflation, and we did this at one point, I mean, it's kind of a U shape. I mean, it was very high, and I, and I take it before... Chandler got into offices, it was really higher, but it, it trended. The city got austere. I mean, when, when Hackett was in office and it went way down, when, when Harrington got in, they realized, I mean, this was the 90s, it was the Clinton years, it was a booming economy. They had a lot of, lot of uh, debt capacity and they started building it back up again. And so it kind of, it ramps out like, like a U shape. And, it, and he, in, in the Harrington years, it, the debt actually, the, the general obligation debt tripled, but you know, adjusted for inflation, it doubled in eight years from 1995 to 2003. It went from about 550,000 to about 1.1 billion. And this is when they were doing, you know, the things that were part of his, his agenda were, you know, addressing these long neglected areas in, in the inner city. And so, Right. And so, Rick, I mean, you're, you were there in the middle of that. I mean, again, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the show, but it was not spending for spending's sake. I assume you didn't all look around each other and go, let's just spend some money. I mean, you were trying to invest in things and trying to, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, major I'm being flippant. Yeah, I apologize. Major, but, yeah, you no. know. Oh, there were major investments that were, that were long, long standing needs to the community. You know, speaking of comments that were made, let's try to invest in the inner city so that people don't leave the right. city. And so that was, those are some of the, the expenditures we made. We listened to our financial advisors during that whole period of time as well, and they uh, gave us, uh, uh, you know, the, the and, and the rating agencies, all double, right. we were double A rated city at that time. So there was, there was never a situation where someone said, hey, you are uh, going beyond your capacity to issue debt. Uh, we were always within our capacity as determined by our financial advisors. And it would, these were investments that Mayor Harrington was elected uh, to make, and the city council yeah. uh, agreed with that. Yeah. Uh, Tom, your sense on spending, I mean, there's debt and then there's spending. And the rise in spending, the staffing, you know, went up dramatically during that period of time. The number, But again, as we said, the amount of services that needed providing, the, the, the number of fire stations, I mean, the physical, as the physical uh, size of the city grows, there's a lot more services. Uh, your take on that? Yeah, period. I think you can find pretty much that same sort of trend line for most cities. Uh, and what's surprising to me, uh, looking at what the city's done, is that it was able to do that and keep its tax rate relatively the same. You think, mm -hmm. if you took the 1980 tax rate of Memphis and apply the inflation rate, the tax rate in Memphis ought to be $10. <laughs> so the fact that they've kept it at what it is, is, uh, is pretty remarkable, uh, particularly taking on that much more yeah. space. And if you compare Memphis to other cities, actually it has fewer employees per capita than many of the comparable cities. And yeah. it's, you know, because most, many of the basic services, community, community right. centers, libraries, parks are underfunded because of public safety. We, we just, two minutes left, I'm gonna go to, this, to, to you first, because you won't be here for our next show. Thoughts about this show, thoughts about the series, things that you wish had been said or that get forgotten mm -hmm. uh, uh, from, your, from your period of time. As I told Mark, I thought the series was excellent. I thought the depth of reporting was excellent. The point I made in one of the first reporters I talked to about it is that we're looking at a 40, 45 year period in Memphis history and priorities in government change dramatically during a 45 year period. So you're not always making an apples to apples comparison when you just look at dollars spent. Uh, you've got to look at what was driving those right. decisions at that point in time. And 
I think that's the one thought I'd leave here, that it, it's just not an apples to apples all the time. Rick, you, you're, I mean, the, the Harrington administration takes some heat in this series. I mean, in part, there's, there's a lot of focus surprise, on Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what you mean, what do I, do I, what do I how do I defend the business? Yeah, or that do you even feel uh, like you need to? No, I, mean, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, Andrew's right. We had, I mean, the mayor had a specific uh, priority that he it came to office. He expected to invest in the, in the city, and uh, we made those investments. We lived, okay. we lived, we were in, you know, he was in, in mayor when a time when they could make those investments and keep the property tax rate rather moderate. Okay. Thank you all for being here. You will join us. Henry, you will be going on. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, we'll get focused on pension because some people I'm sure go, what about pensions and what about the drop program and, and other things? We'll get into those next week with the same panel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com.